Welcome back to our 40 Days to Easter podcast uh, with Pastor Mike. Thanks again, Pastor Mike, for walking us through these days and uh, readings in our devotional. You are more than welcome. Today we are looking at days 8 through 14, and we'll see how many of them uh, we get to as we enter into a new week of reading and a new week of devotional meditation. And I've got to say that I think day 8 might be the time, the place where we need to spend the most time. Okay. Because this story that we read in Numbers 21 is so strange. It is. It, it appears out of nowhere, doesn't it, doesn't it? Well, when you look at the context, because I tried to look at what's happening in the surrounding verses to figure out where, why are there snakes appearing now <laughs> uh, as a consequence, a result of Israel's disobedience? Why yeah. the snakes? And so it looks like Israel has just asked the Lord for victory in uh, conquering this Canaanite land, Canaanite king, and the Lord has given them victory. Mm -hmm. And they are confident in that, in that victory. And so they move forward out of that, having received from the Lord what they asked for. And sure enough, as they begin to travel with Moses, the next place they get, we read Don't say it. the Don't people, say it. The, people become, the people become people convinced. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that wasn't the word I was going to use, but that's probably an appropriate yeah, word. But right. sure enough, no they, bread, no water. They were upset, mm -hmm, unhappy, and they begin to become impatient, and they detest the miserable food. They Absolutely. Don't like it. Yeah, those two phrases there, I think, are awfully relatable. Yeah. That impatience when we are waiting on something, especially from the Lord, and we become impatient, and then the sort of domino effect of that impatience on our attitudes, on our thinking, yeah. is that we become complainers. We, if I don't know a single mother who hasn't heard this very phrase, <laughs> we detest this miserable food. <laughs> I'm so grateful the Lord put this in his word because I feel like well, he's identifying with all of the feeding mothers. feeding your children <laughs> Brussels sprouts. <laughs> oh, my kids love Brussels sprouts, but yeah. in any case, I okay. know you don't, Pastor Mike. Um, here they are, and they're saying, we detest the food, that you're not giving us we, what we want fast enough. And essentially, they're spurning the grace of God. And it comes right after a victory. Yeah. So for me, when I think about that, I, I often will go through a time of trial or difficulty, or, and then the Lord's come through in an incredible way, and I feel closer to him, and that it doesn't take very long for that to wear off and to me to start complaining about something else. Right. And I look back and I go, you know, I look at this and I go, well, you, who, who, who do you people think you are? I, well, you know what? I think they're a lot like me. Mm. They really are. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the way we operate. And it's the cycle we'll see later on in the book of Judges where they get out of line. God brings a discipline upon them. They repent. They straighten back out. They get back into line. And then it happens all over again. So it's pretty predictable in terms of what God's people are like, and so it is here. What is also interesting here is about a snake yeah, on a stick, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Why a snake on a stick? That's a great question. I was hoping you would answer for us today. <laughs> yeah, so snakes, even when we think about uh, the Garden of Eden, we always picture the beast as being a snake, because on the belly you shall go and crawl. So... It, if it was something like a serpent, we tend to think that, um, that that is a representative of evil. And when you think about snakes and their usage throughout Scripture, it's depicted as something that's not good, usually bad and uh, dangerous. And so when you take a staff and you put a snake on top of it and it's lifted up, the obvious implication is just like Jesus was lifted up on the cross, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. But the interesting thing about him being lifted up is simply this. The sin, our sin, was placed on him. So there you have the representative of sin in the snake, mm -hmm. that he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. So it was dependent upon them to look upon the snake, not quite fully understanding what that meant. But for us later on, as we look back, hindsight on it, it's incredible to think about that literally he became sin, right? If you ever see a crucifix, you see Jesus on the cross, you see him dying. The, the 
I guess the beauty of the crucifix reminds us of the seriousness of sin that Christ needed to die, but what's not good about a crucifix is it leaves Jesus on the cross, and he's not going to be there on the cross forever. That moment when he gives his life over to the Father, he commends his spirit to him, you have in an instant, just an instant, when he says, it is finished, you have full humanity, full deity, dwelling in dead flesh. Must have been, I mean, there's just so many questions I want to ask God about that, how that all work out, and mm-hmm. because it's it's amazing. And, and even the statement, you know, when you talk about he became sin, I know that doesn't mean that he was a sinner. Right. But it means he bears the weight of the sin, and I don't quite know, other than in a representative way, how could he be sin? That's that's the hard thing. But I tend to look at it in terms of a representative way, that he was made sin, but at the same time containing no sin of his own. So it's, I guess that's a—you know, in theology we always— make sure we have affirmations and denials. We make sure we have a healthy tension and not go beyond what the text says. I want to be careful there that I don't go beyond that, but that I try to understand the part that I can and wrap my heart around that. Yes, because as Jesus bears our sin on the cross, he bears also the penalty, the full penalty for our sin. And so we get to look at that in these coming days in our readings this week. But before we do, I find it so interesting that God is the one who provided the snakes. Yeah. That's that so right. many times, I mean, we might think of, oh, okay, the snakes are coming as a punishment mm-hmm. for the people's sin. And yet at the same time, maybe we're not thinking of that exactly correctly or in its fullness in the sense that when God disciplines his children, there's an element of punishment I, I, in, in that way. And we'll read that in Hebrews and that word um, that's, that's often translated, God disciplines those mm-hmm. he loves, is, is also translated punishment in other places in the mm-hmm. scripture. Context and so, determines. Yep. Yeah. So there's a part of that, but at the same time, it's not a punishment to condemn, but to save. Right. It is, it is for our he, protection. Yeah. He chastens his own children. Yeah. So he pursues us we talk about the doctrine of love, that's one of the great doctrines of love is Mm -hmm. that he doesn't despise us, but he pursues us. It's like the vine and the branches Mm -hmm. that necessarily at times he needs to prune us, to shape us. When I, when I left my first church, really an awkward situation. I got fired for whatever, all the reasons that they said, you know, and so, okay, well, if it's not working out, we'll move on. But, but you can't move on yet. You have to stay here this Wednesday or, or this Sunday and preach. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I in, ended up preaching my parting sermon, and I preached on John 15. Mm. And, I, and I told mm. them, I said, I, I know I'm not perfect, mm. and my branches need to be pruned to be more effective for ministry. And it was hard, very hard, as anything like that would be. But God was doing just exactly that. He wasn't punishing me. He was disciplining me. He was pruning back those branches as he does for all of us. And it was a hard year, but Mm -hmm. it turned out to be one of the greatest blessings in my life. I don't think I've ever been blessed outside of suffering. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? How it always, God always takes us through a hard time. And then when we come out at the other end, you really get, you really feel the blessing of the Lord. Sure. And I think that the Israelites learned that. Oh yeah. Through this event through this exchange, through this discipline, and they did look to the snake and they were, that was lifted up on that pole and they were saved exactly like you're talking about this love of God that is beyond what we even understand Mm -hmm. sometimes in terms of its full orbed, um, I I guess is a word I like to use, but this Mm -hmm. multi-dimensional characteristics of God's love that not only like a Look diamond with all with, the facets. Yeah, you know, all compassion the and yeah. kindness, but also chasten us and protect us in whatever ways are necessary, mm. um, that that love of God comes to us in that way. And that's exactly what 
Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about right, yeah. when he quotes this, when he refers back to this very event. And so I, I don't know how many people know that one of the most famous verses in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that, the, that he is immediately, before he speaks those words to Nicodemus, says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Right. And then he goes on to pour out that, what has become sort of the Christian mantra of God's love and how it is that we're saved. But it's tied to this event. Yeah, it's exactly right. And we're great at taking things out of historical context and building another theology out of it. But what he is, what he is letting Nicodemus know is that there is a part of God's love that's unconditional. Mm -hmm. That's the part where he's opened wide and his hands are spread out on the cross. And he says, you know, whosoever will, he loves the world. It's his general kindness and goodness and his willing to let you come into a relationship with him. But then there's his special electing love, which is his unique calling of us. Mm -hmm. And so here it is. You've got Nicodemus. And here, here's a guy, Nicodemus, that doesn't even quite understand all the analogy of the fullness of the metaphors that are involved here. Well, Jesus said to him, you're the teacher of Israel. You yeah, should know these things. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And he's blind as can be about mm -hmm. it. That's Absolutely. so true. Yeah. I often think of that about the second coming. Everybody's got it all figured out, and I'm sure that there's going to be some pages that we've missed or didn't understand. Oh, I think the Lord has some <laughs> wondrous things to show yeah, us that we too. haven't even begun to I conceive. I do, too. So not only did they not see Jesus in Moses lifting up the snake, right? but they also missed, as you're talking to us about here, this idea, this reality of Jesus as king, yeah. that they missed that. And right. so in day nine, we read these passages in Deuteronomy and 1 Samuel um, that help us see and understand that the people of Israel were looking for a king. They were asking for a yeah. king. Yeah. So I don't think they, maybe we could say it this way. They were looking for a king mm -hmm. that would be the king they wanted to overthrow the Roman yes. government. Yes. And not the king that is going to be a humble servant that exactly. comes and gives his life. And that's what happened in John yeah. 19. Yeah. And it's the Roman soldiers themselves, that very people that they want overthrown, right? Because they're yeah. the enemies of Israel at the time. And they're nearly mocking the Israelites, right? Saying, right. shall I crucify your king is right. the question that Pilate asks right. the Pharisees. And they respond with vehemence. We yeah. have no king but Caesar, right. right? And so they're rejecting Jesus as king in, that, in, this, um, in this exchange right here. And so we're challenged, is Jesus... Is he your king? Is he our king? Yeah. Yeah. What are the implications of him being the king? It's pretty significant when you look at it, you know. I mean, even when the children of Israel wanted a king, it came with a warning. Look, he's going to tax you. He's going to take your your young. He's going to take your best of your best and take your servants and take everything else. And that's a pretty daunting thing to think about the power that a king has in those days as an absolute monarch. Right. And so if we were to let Christ really rule our lives as 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 a king— he should get the best of everything we have. Yes, that everything. rule and reign of, of Jesus Christ over our lives requires everything yeah. from us. Yeah. And and thank God he is a good king. He's a he's a he's a he's a good king and a loving king. And not only is he good and loving and benevolent towards us, uh, he's so merciful. Yeah. And and isn't it interesting this time that we're calling the already and the not yet mm -hmm. is the kingdom of God, yeah. which is the redemptive rule and reign of Jesus Christ, where he overcomes all and ultimately will be enthroned as he defeats sin. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that absolutely. day when it's absolutely done. Yeah, and we're going to get to that on day 13. But before we do, let's just kind of talk briefly about these few days in between okay. and why we can trust Jesus as our King. Mm. So day 10, day 11, day 12, we see Jesus in some pretty incredible ways. And we see him foreshadowed, foretold in the Old Testament, where we see in Psalm 22 that, that Jesus can be trustworthy as our King and as our substitute, as our sacrifice, because he bore 
the penalty of our sin, which was separation from God. Yeah. So this is this Psalm 22 is a great section of Scripture because it's a trilogy. You have Psalm 22, 23, and 24. Of course, the 23rd Psalm, most people are aware of that. He is my mm-hmm. shepherd. Mm-hmm. 24 talks about how he does that as shepherd. And this 22 is amazing because he is talking about what he is actually going to do. He's going to bear the sin, and he's going to say, why have you forsaken me, God? And it's amazing. We are often compared to, in the Scripture, as sheep. And I was driving out to the um, Tulare Farm show yesterday, and uh, it was interesting. We came along several sections of land where there were sheep and lambs. And I thought, well, if we're going to have some lambs for our petting zoo for (laughs) Easter, maybe I'll just grab a couple and put them in the truck, but (laughs) I didn't. But here's no matter what you do, okay, I went to the farm show, you look at all the automated equipment, sheep still get put in a corral. Mm. They still, there's no other way to do it. Mm. You got to put them in a corral because they wander off and they get lost. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think our Lord identifies us so much as the lost sheep, Mm. right? And he loves us. He comes and he finds us. I think of that picture of placing a sheep on your shoulders and carrying that sheep back home and rescuing them because they just get in danger. Because we live a lot in a fallen and a suffering world. And he came to suffer for us in order that we might become his. And that's what day 11 is all about. Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 53, that as we look at verses 3 through 6, we understand that he was despised and rejected by mankind. Mm-hmm. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Yeah. What a trustworthy... In my uh, eighth grade language class right now, I'm teaching eighth graders how to write over at Trinity Lutheran School for a, a little can season I, here. Can I get in on that? <laughs> but we are right now talking about ethos and pathos and logos. Mm-hmm. And we're talking specifically about what is this? What does it mean to be ethical? What does it mean to be credible? How is someone, how do you demonstrate that someone is trustworthy? Mm. And so as these eighth graders are learning how to write, they have to figure out how to how to write in such a way that makes people believe them so that they are credible sources, how to bring in credible sources that are relevant uh, to the argument that they're trying to make. And if the argument we're trying to make here is that we are sinners who need God's grace, that there is a penalty of sin that is suffering, how much more credible of a Savior could we have than one who comes and takes that suffering, identifies Mm -hmm. with us in that suffering so that we can trust him completely? Yeah, absolutely. You haven't suffered. You really haven't learned anything about life, and this this idea here of the great suffering servant is remarkable. Probably the best that I've ever and I've I've read a lot on Isaiah fifty three, mm-hmm. but I think one of the best times I have ever seen it presented to a person who did not know Christ mm. was in an interview with Ben Shapiro, who's mm. a Jew. Very astout, uh, very learned, uh, sharp, sharp guy. And he was interviewing John MacArthur. Mm. And John MacArthur went through, verse by verse, Isaiah 53 for a good 50 minutes. And it was so beautifully laid out, so beautifully laid out. And I just thought to myself, how could anybody sit through that and, and not believe in Jesus as the Messiah? Mm. So I would recommend to anybody, if you ever get a chance, it's online, and you can just get it. It's on YouTube. But it's a great picture of everything that Christ did and was fulfilled in Isaiah 53, written many years before Christ even was on the face of this earth. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we see that our Lord Jesus Christ took the penalty of our sin that was separation from God, that he bore our suffering Uh, which again is a part of that penalty of sin. And then in day 12, we see Christ, the picture of Christ as our deliverer. Yeah. And interestingly, uh, Kenneth Boa, who wrote this little devotional, brings Judges chapter two into play where we get to see the picture of the judges in Israel and how the judge, maybe even contrary to the way we understand judges in our right. society or culture, but they were deliverers. They, they were, were the deliverers. They brought... were warriors. They were deliverers. Yeah. Their job was to keep the people close to God and mm-hmm. their relationship with him. And uh, they would have victory over their enemies and then teach them to rest in the Lord and depend upon them. So 
when it comes to judges, these are predecessors. They're not kings. They're they're not rulers in that sense as much as they are. And and when you look at the number of them, mm-hmm. you got to remember that they're not in chronological order, and it's more to, uh, perhaps to be better understood as um, theological rather than chronicle. Mm. And uh, I I just love their emphasis and the and the variety, male and female. God mm-hmm. used both. Yep. We don't think of a warrior, you know, like like Deborah. Right. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, she's one of the judges promoting obedience to the covenant of God. And that's exactly what these people did. Absolutely. And so we see Jesus as a new and better deliverer. Yes. He is the fullness of everything that God had promised to his people. We see in part in the fulfillment that he gives them through the judges. And we see complete in Christ, who is our ultimate and perfect deliverer. Right. So they had to keep having judges because they'd fall mm-hmm. out of favor with God and God would judge them. There's that cycle again that repeats throughout all of humanity. But so much of that is just spelled out here in Judges. They sin, they get disciplined for their sin, chastised by the Lord, they repent, they have a season of good uh, walk with God, steady obedience to the covenant, and then they ultimately fall back into sin again. Yes, and God rescues them as he, he gives them opportunities and provides all kinds of ways for them to repent yeah. as a good father and as yeah. a perfect deliverer. I think sometimes when we read our Bibles, we see the characters, we see the events and exchanges um, between people and God, and our focus tends to lean toward the people. It's easy mm-hmm. for us to identify with them when really every single thing we're seeing is pointing us toward Jesus. This is a story about him. This is a yeah. book about him and how we are to understand our God mm-hmm. in our Lord Jesus Christ and right. that kingdom of God as we orient our thinking, as we orient our feeling, and we we bring um, all of those things under this idea of what you were talking about before, mm-hmm. that is the already not yet, the the kingdom of God. And that's really what we're looking at in day 13 as we kind of wrap up our conversation for Today is this idea of the kingdom of God, and Mm -hmm. we see the kingdom of God prophesied all over the Old Testament, but maybe none as familiar as Isaiah chapter 9, which we often quote at Christmas time, right? right? For Mm -hmm. to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then, so that's the what will be the already when Christ is incarnate, then we get the not yet, right? Then right. we get the telescopic kind of understanding of what's going on here yep. theologically of the greatness of his government and peace. There will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. And so talk to us a little bit about this. There's well, something happening in the text that's yeah. even more than we can immediately see at a cursory yeah, glance. He's, he's letting us know in this passage of scripture, you'll notice in the text that they use in Isaiah 9, mm-hmm. there is the part of the text that's clearly speaking to where Jesus is and where he comes and walks among us. And then there's another aspect of it that goes beyond his earthly reign and rule to the, to the not yet when he is fully king of everything. Mm -hmm. So he's our Lord and our King. And you look around and somebody would read a passage like this today in the world and say, well, it doesn't look like he's a very good King. If he's a good King, why doesn't he stop all the evil that's taking place, all the... Kill all the snakes. Yeah, right, mm-hmm. exactly. And the, here it is, is. You've got a first and a second coming woven into one verse of Scripture. Mm-hmm. They didn't quite understand that. And it must have been odd for Mary, too, to be able to be told that your child is going to be the deliverer and look at the pain and the suffering she bore in her heart. Yes. And she's got to be thinking, wait a minute, you said that he was going to be the deliverer of Israel, even when he's taken into Simeon's hands and he blesses him and sings over him. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, all the trouble that he went through. And and that is because his first part of his mission was to fulfill the forgiveness of sins and provide the way as the mediator. And then his second aspect will be his rule in his reign in his coming. And that's when the fullness of that is going to take place. Mm -hmm. And so we live in that time between the already, that which we already have in Christ, and the not yet, which has not yet been fulfilled yet. There's still more to the story that Jesus needs to do. Yes, absolutely. So 
we have the joy then as we walk through these 40 days of thinking ever more deeply about all that Christ has done for us, about who he is and who we are then in relationship to him so that we might be among those that the Bible says marvel at his coming. I want to be counted among that number, not those who are just expecting maybe him to come, but are are waiting eagerly. Yes, we eagerly wait, Paul says. We eagerly Mm -hmm. await. And it's not just, I'm going to get a new body. That's important, but it's not the fullness of it. Mm -hmm. It's to embrace the fullness of his redemptive rule and reign. That's what it's all about. And so we long for that day when it's finally finished and completed. It's, It's all those tensions in scripture. It's the already, I'm already saved, and yet I'm being saved, and yet I will be saved. Right. All these tensions that we face and we live out every single day remind us of the coming rule and reign of the king when he fully comes and takes his position, a rightful ruler of all things, and we walk in that millennial kingdom with him. Absolutely. Well, thanks for walking us through these days of readings and devotions and meditations, just that word that means we think deeply about these biblical truths. And I don't know about you, Pastor Mike, I tend to think of things in terms of food, um, but spending this what time, I like about you, Shelley. <laughs> <laughs> spending this time in the scripture and not just reading these things, but thinking on them mm-hmm. in this way right. is kind of like what you do when you make a stew. You know what the ingredients are and you take them all, but you've got to put them on a nice, low, slow temperature to cook for a long time in order for those ingredients to develop a real depth of flavor and to bring that warm dish all together where everything is melded and then you have then in your bowl something that's altogether more wonderful than the, than the simple ingredients that you put in to begin with. Yeah, right. And so that's, that's my hope um, for us is that as we take in these truths that we would sort of let them come together, those flavors come mm-hmm. together, that they would remain in our hearts, that we would continue to think about them and pray through them, um, that we might be ready on Resurrection Sunday mm. to rejoice with a new depth of yeah. understanding. Yeah. Stew on these truths. <laughs> and right. on that cheesy <laughs> uh, phrase there, yes, let's... Uh, We'll end our conversation for today and look forward to having the opportunity to come back next week um, as we preview next week's reading. But we pray that all of you who are joining us on this journey uh, would be growing in the grace and the wisdom of our Lord Jesus Christ through his word. Thank you, Shelley. Absolutely. Thank Thank you, Pastor Mike. And we'll see you all next week.